Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to part three of three on gastric gist tumors, pearls, and pitfalls. Now, I mentioned last time, the last thing we were speaking about was some of the mimics of gist tumors. We spoke a little bit about uh, metastasis. We also then were looking at this case. Here's a large mass left up a quadrant. This was referred to our endocrine surgeon for a adrenal carcinoma, a suspected adrenal carcinoma. And you can understand why that's a possibility. And you look at the enhancement, there is some enhancement, but when you look carefully at the lesion, it's really related to the stomach. And in fact, you can see a normal adrenal gland right there. So when you look at it, this ends up being a large gist tumor which simulated an adrenal mass. So sometimes it's challenging. When you have large masses, the epicenter can be tricky. A key thing, of course, is trying to find the adrenal. If you find the adrenal, you know it's not an adrenal mass. And a beautiful, well-defined soft tissue mass, exophytic gist tumor. And again, I could see why, particularly the image on your left, when you look quickly, the first thing you say is a primary adrenal carcinoma or a large adrenal mass, maybe a pheo. But again, this was a gist tumor, a really nice pitfall. And again, the image on your left really nicely showing the adrenal gland and the mass pushing directly against the adrenal gland. Here it is with cinematic. And I think the cinematic actually really localizes the tumor better and you really can see that exophytic component that it really is a gastric mass and it's not an adrenal mass. Just a very nice example showing you that. And here it is on the sagittal view as well, very nicely defined. Now, this case, I read this as a uh, really necrotic gist tumor. It's a large mass. It looks like the rest of them I showed you. This ended up being biopsied. This was a retroperitoneal liposarcoma. Again, liposarcomas don't necessarily have fat. This didn't. This looks all the world like a gastric gist tumor. And I think I would call it a gist tumor again. I wouldn't say can rule out liposarcoma. There's some enhancement within the lesion. There's some ulceration. Looks like a classic large gist tumor. This was a liposarcoma. Again, look at the coronal views. Pushing on the, the lesser curvature of the stomach, really looks like a gist tumor. So again, some of that overlap. Or this case, this looks to me like a large ulcerating gist tumor involving the spleen extending down by the kidney and adrenal gland. This ended up being a large tail of the pancreas cancer which invaded the spleen, the kidney, and the stomach. So sometimes it can be tricky. Usually I don't have a problem with that differential diagnosis. Usually I'm certain whether something is or isn't pancreas, but here's a nice example where it was very difficult and it was only on biopsy could you make the right diagnosis. And this was also a patient who was sent to a multidisciplinary pancreatic cancer conference because it was assumed without the biopsy that this was going to be a pancreatic cancer. But could it be just, you know, very, very difficult, very difficult overlapping. Here's some more images. So I will say that large pancreatic masses which invade the stomach can be confused with gist tumors. What about this case? Patient with GI bleeding, there's a large mass with this intra and extra luminal. Not very difficult. There's air bubbles, there's ulceration. This patient had weight loss. This is surely a malignancy. That's not really hard. But based on its large size, I felt this was probably an ulcerating gist tumor. This was biopsied. It was an adenocarcinoma. Now, we typically don't think of adenocarcinomas that large. Adenocarcinomas commonly bleed. They ulcerate. That's not the issue. But it was the pure size of the lesion, that appearance, here it is on the sagittal view, that made us think of an ulcerating gist tumor. So again, you can see that there is overlap between adenocarcinoma occasionally and gist tumors when they get very large. And that's one of the larger adenocarcinomas I think I've seen in a very, very long time. See it nicely coronal and sagittal, large, bulky tumor, ulcerations very nicely shown. Here's another example. Again, this looks like a large gist tumor, large exophytic mass extending toward kidney and spleen. This was biopsy. This was an adenocarcinoma. Again, I would read this as a gist tumor, large exophytic mass, areas of necrosis. I don't really see the difficulty in the diagnosis. The one thing that was helpful perhaps 
is when you look at this component of the mass, it looks like gist. But when you look at this component of the mass, look at that infiltration of the body, both on the lesser and greater curvatures, kind of circumferential. If I showed you this picture only, you would say it's an adenocarcinoma. You could think of metastasis, I guess, theoretically. Lymphoma would even be a possibility, but less likely. But, you know, it had a big exophytic component. So I guess looking at the stomach itself, those other cuts, I would have picked a gastric adenocarcinoma from these images. But again, big exophytic component. So just the learning process is that sometimes adenocarcinoma is going to have big exophytic components and that just tumor diagnosis, which seemed very easy in part one of this lecture, can be somewhat challenging. And again, here's the cinematic rendering showing you the mass. But again, from a texture perspective, it looks very much like the gist tumors we have saw before. So very, very challenging. And again, it's one of the pitfalls, and it's one of the reasons why patients get biopsied before they get the therapy or surgery. Just a very nice example. And again, cinematic rendering from a sagittal perspective, very nicely shown. Now, I mentioned before metastasis can cause issues. Here's a large mass, necrotic, looks like a gist tumor, exophytic. This was metastatic melanoma. I've seen a handful of melanomas now where there's large exophytic components. Remember, melanoma often goes to small bowel, goes to uh, colon, with large masses. And the stomach, the same thing. Most of the time we see intraluminal metastasis, but here large exophytic component, ulcerations, again, a perfect mimicker for a gist tumor. This was metastatic melanoma. And again, if you read this image, patient comes in with abdominal pain, you say this is a gist tumor, it'll proven otherwise. I guess one thing helpful here, the patient has nodes, which are a bit uncommon with gist tumors, we mentioned that. This was biopsy and it was melanoma. So just a really nice example. And again, melanoma is one of the great mimickers. I've seen what looks like pancreatic masses or duodenal masses or small bowel tumors that look like primaries and the metastatic melanoma. So one comment to make is left upper quadrant masses when large can be hard to localize. Same thing here. If you look at this case quickly, a very large mass, you could think Maybe it's a bit cystic and necrotic, but again, just would be in your ballpark. This was an MCN, multi-cystic um, uh, pancreatic neoplasm. Um, MCNs typically occur in the body of the stomach. They're three to five centimeters, but these mucinous cystic neoplasms can be very large. Look how cystic it is. Look how large it is. Again, it abuts the stomach. Serous cyst adenomas can look very similar to this. So very large cystic pancreatic masses can be somewhat of a challenge. One thing helpful perhaps is this lesion is very cystic. And I've showed you a lot of gist tumors. Unless the patient has had Gleevec therapy, they don't become this cystic. So cystic with septations, MCNs are a very good possibility. Here it is again with cinematic rendering, just a beautiful example. So the septation part is really good for MCNs. I was showing a case in conference the other day of a large cystic tail lesion, not as large as this, but again with septations making the point when you see septations that typically represents a path ovarian stroma. So it's really good to consider an MCN. And I love the cinematic, when you change the rendering, look how all of the vessels are displaced. I don't think you're going to see vessel displacement like that with a spend tumor. Uh, I don't think you're going to see displacement like that with a serous cyst adenoma. I don't think you're going to see displacement like that with a gist tumor. I think MCNs are really good at causing significant vessel displacement. And here's the sagittal view with cinematic rendering as well. And really, uh, in this case, the patient's tumor is resected. You can see the vessels were not invaded, the vessels were displaced, and it was a rough surgery because of lesion size, but the surgeon did well, and more importantly, the patient did well. Just beautiful example of the vessels. Another case, again, look at its relationship to the stomach, looks like a gist tumor. This was a 20-ish year old patient, solid mass, pancreatic, spent tumor. Spent tumors, commonly late teenage years, in their 20s, 
uh, usually the smaller cystic and solid. Here it's cystic and solid and necrotic, but again, the relationship to the stomach. Look at that relationship. Okay, I'll go back one. Look at that relationship. I would have thought it was coming off the stomach. It simply was abutting the stomach. Again, a very, very challenging case. And I think what helped here a little bit was the patient's age because you're not going to see gist tumors in 22-year-olds. Here was some of the stretching of the vessels, narrowing of the portal vein SMV confluence. Uh, most of the time, spend tumors, uh, solitary papillary epithelial neoplasms, uh, are uh, simply uh, non-aggressive, usually a 90 plus percent cure rate, but sometimes they can be aggressive. And this was one of the examples. Again, areas of necrosis, but that relationship to the stomach, look at the collateral vessels. But again, I would have considered just tumor, just a beautiful set of images on the cinematic rendering. Now, other mimickers, here's a lesion which is both intraluminal and extraluminal, though mainly intraluminal but it's water density. Remember, even necrotic gist tumors, they're usually larger, they can be necrotic, but this is water density and homogeneous. This is not a gist tumor. This is a duplication cyst. Water density, well-defined. Duplication cysts are uncommon. This is just a beautiful example of a duplication cyst. You could see it has some components, the intraluminal appearance, maybe the intraluminal, extraluminal, that dumbbell appearance, that maybe makes you think about um, a gist tumor, but the water density, homogeneous, wall enhancement slightly, beautiful example of a gastric duplication cyst. Now there are mimickers also. This was sent in as a gist tumor, and I read this as a gist tumor. But then you notice on the image on the left that maybe some enhancement, but we said just tumors enhance. But then I went from arterial to venous phase and it's more enhancement. And you look at it, it kind of looks like puddling. I said, boy, and I dictated, what an unusual appearance of puddling in a just tumor. Well, at PATH, this ended up being a hemangioma. Now the patient was having left upper quadrant pain, so this would have been resected. But it looks so much like it's coming off the stomach. But when you looked at all the images, there's areas where it comes very much near the left lobe of the liver. Now, it's rare for hemangiomas to be exophytic, but they can occur. And I've now seen about six cases, all potential pitfalls, all misread initially, almost all of them outside misread, where they're exophytic coming off the left lobe of the liver, pushing on the stomach, but really simulating a gastric mass, which was thought to be a gist tumor. Again, the key thing here that helps you is that puddling enhancement. But look at the view. This is the touching of the left lobe of the liver. That's the exophytic component. Very unusual, but I've seen a number of these cases now. So it's a really good pitfall. Here's another one, again, read as a gist tumor. But again, the same thing coming off the left lobe laterally, exophytic, again, the enhancement pattern is very, very valuable. But again, a really, really good pitfall. The first time I saw this, it said gist tumor on the rec. I remember looking at the PATH report, it said hemangioma. I called the PATH, said you made a mistake. They said, no, you made the mistake, not us. So that first one I missed, the next five I've gotten right. But again, look at the images. Looks very much like a gist tumor. So again, at times, exophytic hemangiomas can be confused with gist tumors. I've also seen exophytic hemangiomas been biopsied and they're read as angiosarcomas. So again, a very, very good pitfall, just a beautiful example. And that enhancement, that puddling, can really help you along. And here's that same case with cinematic rendering, just a really, really nice example and a real challenge. Now, I mentioned at the start that most gist tumors are sporadic, but there are several syndromes. Carnage striatus syndrome, where you also have paragangliomas. Carnage triad, where you also have pulmonary chondromas and paragangliomas and familiar gist tumors. So those are the three things. They're rare, but you never know. Primary familial gist tumors, a rare inherited condition that increases your risk of developing gist tumors. Uh, most often this syndrome is caused by an abnormal kit gene that is passed from parent to child. Uh, it's the same gene that is mutated in most sporadic 
just tumors. In neurofibromatosis, again, the defect in the NF1 gene, which can be inherited. People affected by the syndrome often have many benign nerve sheet tumors, typically neurofibromas. They also have multiple skin lesions. Patients with neurofibromatosis 1 have a higher risk of just tumors, most commonly in small bowel, most commonly in duodenum, but they can also get other findings. But again, a patient with neurofibromatosis typically will have other lesions. Here's a nice example of a exophytic 2 centimeter lesion in a patient with no neurofibromatosis. That was a GIST tumor. And you can see when I look at the patient's skin, you can see multiple neurofibromas. And then you see the mass in the stomach as well on the cinematic, uh, that exophytic nature of the patient's tumor, just really nicely shown. So uncommon entity, but with neurofibromatosis, you see a lot of things, renal artery stenosis, you see lots of neurofibromas on the skin, you see nerve sheath tumors, and you see gastric gist tumors. Carnet striatus syndrome is really an unusual syndrome. Younger patients, uh, just tumors in the stomach, often multiple, they can metastasize, and again, paragangliomas. It's a rare inherited condition, and the paragangliomas is really what allows you to make the diagnosis. And I won't go into the genetics, but I'll just share an example. Multiple gastric gist tumors. This case was published uh, by Hannah Recht in radiology this past year. Just a beautiful example. And when I quiz people on this, I say the patient has a neck mass. Multiple gastric uh, gist tumors and a neck mass. Very, very classic appearance. A very unusual case. Most patients with GIST tumors will have single lesions. When you see multiple lesions like this, you better consider a syndrome, particularly when it's a younger patient. Just a beautiful example. And I guess you say, well, how rare is this? This is the only case I've seen, and radiology also published it. So we've looked at a number of things. We looked at gastric GIST tumors. We spoke about intraluminal versus extraluminal. Most are extraluminal. The largest lesions are extraluminal, and sometimes then dumbbell lesions, both intra and extraluminal at the same time. We talked about the importance of five centimeters. Over five centimeters, you're worried about malignancy. Under five, they're usually benign, but they're watched very carefully. Um, most are resected. People will argue under two cm should you resect. Vascularity is variable. The smaller lesions are more vascular than the larger lesions. In general, most gastric tumors that are just are not very vascular. Calcification is uncommon, but it does occur. These lesions can rupture, and you can see extra gastric spread. And there are pitfalls in diagnosis, whether it's retroperitoneal masses like a liposarcoma, whether it's a large gastric adenocarcinoma, whether it's an adrenal mass or a large pancreatic mass and can be somewhat challenging. So there are lots of pitfalls, and we've gone through that. So concluding, GIST tumors have a very specific CT pattern that you can recognize most of the time. We look for spread. We look for changes uh, in the tumor with areas of necrosis and ulceration. Again, some of the largest tumors present as abdominal pain. Others present with GI bleeding. But hopefully, after you've seen a lot of cases, and I know I've shown you a lot of images, which was my intent, hopefully you have a better feeling and whether you're looking at the axials, but the help that coronals provide, the help that 3D imaging, including cinematic, provides is very real. So with that, I'll stop there, and thank you very much for your attention, and hope you enjoy these lectures. Catch you later. Bye. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.